Father in heaven, thank you for this passage of Scripture, God. I, I praise you and thank you that you have uh, given us your word, God, uh, a sure guide, a pure converting the soul. And we are grateful for it, God, and rejoice to submit ourselves to it. We acknowledge, Lord, that we are under the authority of your word. Attend to the preaching of your word with your spirit, God. Pierce our hearts, convict us, Lord, over uh, where we are in sin. And God, soften, humble our hearts toward you that we might live for you more fervently and obey you, God, to walk worthy of the calling with which you've called us. And we want to honor you in these things. We want to see Christ exalted. And so, Lord, be with us as we do this. And God, I pray that if there's anyone here that isn't saved, God, that you would convict them over sin, that you would draw them to yourself, God, and that you would plow up the stony ground of their heart and save their soul for your great name's sake. And we pray all these things for your glory, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In our scripture... Uh, our pe- sermon title this morning is Godly Compassion. Godly Compassion. And we are working through this paragraph in 1 Timothy now, chapter 5, verses 3 through 16. And as is our, our custom, we just go verse by verse through the Bible. And so we've been working verse by verse through 1 Timothy. And we finally come here to chapter 5, where Paul turns in his emphasis on uh, the character and quality of Timothy's ministry to now how Timothy and how the church at Ephesus is to interrelate with one another. Again, all of this with the purpose that we are to know how we're to conduct ourselves in the household of God. So as we come to this passage, we uh, in verses 1 and 2 from chapter 5, we know how to interact, interact with older men, older women, younger men, younger women. And now in verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 3, we begin to look at widows. And there is a fairly lengthy chapter here, a fairly lengthy passage dealing with widows. And there's a lot to be said here and a lot that we can glean that will help us. Uh, To get started, I guess to set the stage for godly compassion and God's heart of compassion toward the needy, I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about your greatest need. What's the greatest need that you have? Very good. Think about it. I mean, some may say right off the bat, uh, I don't know where my next check is going to come from, or my car needs the oil changed, or whatever it may be. Think about your greatest need. A Baptist pastor, I heard the story of a Baptist pastor. Baptist pastor gets on a plane, he was on a trip, gets on a plane in Washington, D.C., and he sits down on the plane next to a lawyer from Washington, D.C. So the lawyer turns to him and said, hey, you know, my name is so-and-so, what do you do for a living? I'm a Baptist pastor. What do you do for a living? I'm a lawyer. And so the lawyer turns to him and asks the question. He says, you know, with all the things that are going wrong in this world, with all the problems and problems here and problems there, how do you focus on all those problems in order to be able to preach to the people and help the people? And so the Baptist pastor responds, there aren't all those problems. There's only three problems in the world. There is sin, there's sorrow, and there's death. And so the lawyer said, no, 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 no. There are all kinds of problems. You've got problems with people, problems in families, problems with the economy, problems in other countries, problems with the government, problems with X, Y, and Z. And the Baptist pastor said, oh no, there are only three problems in the world. It is sin, sorrow, and death. So the lawyer, there are many more problems than that. Think about all the psychological disorders. I mean, you hear how the conversation is going, and the Baptist pastor replies, there are only three problems in the world, sin, sorrow, and death. And so on the plane flight, He left the Washington lawyer to sit and consider that. By the time the plane lands, the Washington lawyer turns to the Baptist pastor and says, there's only three problems in the world. (laughs) There's sin, sorrow, and death. Everything flows really out of those three problems, sin, sorrow, and death. Sorrow and death flow out of the greatest problem, which is sin. Everything flows out of the greatest problem, which is sin. The greatest problem that we have, the greatest problems that we face, all flow out of sin. That's whether you're a Christian, an atheist, a Muslim, a Buddhist, you have a sin problem. The world has a sin problem, and all problems flow from sin. If you sit and think about it and ponder it for a while, you'll know that to be true. Think about it. The reason that we have lawyers in the first place is because of sin, right? But think about it, all the the sorrow, all sickness, all pain, all suffering, all guilt, all shame, all destruction, all despair, all hopelessness, all emptiness, all loneliness, 
all terror, every fear, every doubt, every hurtful loss, every form of injury, every form of hurt, every wrong, every form of injustice, all poverty, all starvation, all war, every form of decay, the depraved nature of man, death, both physical and spiritual, eternal, everlasting torment in hell, the eternally rising smoke of an unquenchable fire, the righteous anger, the justifiable fury, the perfect wrath of our deeply offended Creator God who is holy, holy, holy and will punish sinners because of their sin. Have you come to sense your greatest problem? That is the greatest problem. Everything else pales in comparison. Everything else flows from that, our greatest problem. What is your greatest problem? Your personal, you personally, your greatest problem. I'm talking to you, you liar, (laughs) you thief, you adulterer, you who have had lustful thoughts in your heart, you drunkard, you idolater, you homosexual, you who go through the outward, external motions of an empty religion with no heart for Christ, you who love the passing pleasures of this world, you who are ashamed of Christ and ashamed of His Word. And you who despise the preaching of His Word. So what is your greatest problem? What is your greatest problem? I submit to you that your greatest problem is God. I submit to you that your greatest problem is God for you personally. Because God is holy and will not tolerate the least rebellion. God is just And he will not allow the least of impurities in your wicked heart to go unpunished. You're going to stand before him one day very soon, and you're going to be judged. You could die at any moment, and it will be too late. Today, you could die tomorrow. You could die in your house, in your car. You could die in your sleep. You could die at the game on your phone, climbing a flight of stairs, in a storm, at a party, slipping on a sidewalk, alone in your room. You could die slowly because of sickness, or you could die quickly and unexpectedly because of an injury. But be certain your time is running out. You may know ahead of time, or it may come on you unexpectedly. So you have a need. You have a great problem. And you have a great need. What is a great need that you have? Have you come to understand? Have you come to sense what a great need that you have? It is a great need. It's a great need not if you don't truly fear living or dying without it. You don't sense it if you can lay your head on your pillow and sleep in peace without it. You don't sense it if you are hard-hearted, self-righteous, and defensive. You don't get it. You don't sense your great need if you haven't mourned over your wicked sin and your lack of it. You haven't sensed your great need if you haven't hungered and thirsted for it. If you haven't sorrowed in a godly manner over lack of it, If you haven't given heart, soul, mind, and strength to live in light of it, you haven't sensed your need if you're deceived and you think you're okay, uh, even though you're a sinner. Your great need, a great need, is to be right with Him, to be right with God. Your great need is to be righteous in His sight. If you haven't come to sense your great need, you are not a Christian. The Lord will bear it, bring it to bear on your heart to come to understand your great need of Him. You can't do it yourself. You can't be righteous in His sight by yourself. You can't be right with Him by yourself. You can't make yourself cleansed in all your filth. You are by nature a child of wrath. You are by nature a son of disobedience. And you need a perfect substitute. 
someone who is righteous for you to stand in your place before God, someone who will take upon himself the wicked stains of your sin, someone who will credit to you the white robes of his own righteousness, someone who will bear the awful punishment that you rightly deserve, someone who can perfectly satisfy the perfect justice of God against your sin, someone who conquered death and was raised from the dead for your justification. The only one who can do that is God himself. So it's not as much an it that you need as much as it is a who that you need. You need Christ. You need the righteousness of another. In that great grace alone, God made himself of no reputation, took the form of a bondservant, and came in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And Jesus Christ the Lord of glory, the perfect spotless lamb of God died for sinners. You have a great problem, a great problem. You have a great need, but we have a great savior. We've been given a great compassionate gift from a compassionate God. Jesus Christ calls you now to despise and to turn from your greatest problem. That's the sin and to turn to and embrace and trust in and rely upon your greatest need, which is Christ. God is a God who rejoices in showing compassion, displaying His perfect attribute of love through His acts of compassion toward those in need. And He rejoices in showing compassion toward our greatest need. Our greatest need is Him, is Christ. That's a felt needs theology, right? Unlike the felt needs that we come to know in, in most of evangelicalism today, that's our need. D.A. Carson, in his book entitled A Call to Spiritual Reformation, said this. He said, if God had perceived that our greatest need was economic, he would have sent us an economist. If he had perceived that our greatest need was entertainment, he would have sent us a comedian or an artist. If God had perceived that our greatest need was political, he would have sent us a politician. If he had perceived that our greatest need was health, he would have sent us a doctor. But he perceived that our greatest need involved our sin, our alienation from him, our profound rebellion, and our death, and he sent us a savior. That's the compassion of God. That's godly compassion. When we don't deserve it. You are a wicked sinner and you don't deserve it. God didn't have to make provision for our sin, and yet he did in his great love and in his great compassion. We serve a God who is compassionate. And God, who meets our greatest need in Christ Jesus, says in Romans 8, 32, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And the Lord promises in compassion toward needy sinners that he'll work all things together for your good, give you every spiritual blessings, all spiritual blessings in Christ. This is a God of compassion. Now think about it for a moment. To make an argument here, from the lesser to the greater, God displays his perfect attribute of love through compassion in many ways to those who are needy, all right? That compassion should drive the sinner to the greatest display of compassion in Christ. That godly compassion displayed by God for us should drive the Christian to display godly compassion to others in need. This is the goodness, as Romans says, and forbearance of God that should lead the sinner to repentance. It's the goodness of God. Let me give you several examples of this. The heart of God, God's compassion toward the needy. In Acts chapter 14, verse 15, Paul's preaching. He says to pagans, to lost people, he says that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways, Nevertheless, God did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, even to lost people, to pagans. He did good. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. That's the compassion of God. That's the common grace of God to all people, filling our hearts with food and gladness. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17, the Bible says, he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord and the Lord will pay back what he has given. In other words, the Lord blesses the, someone who takes pity on the poor. 
In Psalm chapter 9, verse 18, he says, For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. In Psalm 146, beginning in verse 7, he says, Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. Here in Psalm 146, it's interesting, he begins to mention those that at the time were the most needy, the most needy, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And the Lord shows compassion toward them. There are many places in Scripture that describe that. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, beginning in verse 19, listen to the Lord's compassion toward the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. He says, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. Why? It shall be, God says, for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. In other words, if you're compassionate, if you're compassionate toward the stranger, toward the fatherless, and toward the widow, the Lord's going to bless you in the work of your hands. The opposite would also be true. Show no compassion toward the fatherless, the orphan, and the widow. There will be no blessing for the work of your hands. It goes on to say, when you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the boughs again. In other words, leave some of the fruit on the tree. He says, it shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And when you gather the grapes in your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. We see the example of Elijah caring for the widow in Zarephath in 1 Kings chapter 17. We see the great compassion of God, don't we, towards Ruth. Ruth gleaning in the fields because Boaz was obeying the Lord here, being compassionate on the fatherless and the widow. And the kinsman redeemer, I encourage you, man, to go read Ruth and study that issue of the kinsman redeemer. Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, redeems Ruth from being a widow, showing great compassion. And so then, out of great compassion, Boaz and Ruth are married. Boaz and Ruth give birth to Obed, who was the father of Jesse. He was the grandfather of David. And through David's lineage, <laughs> we see the compassion of God toward wicked sinners like you and me. Because it points forward to our great kinsman redeemer in Jesus Christ, who redeemed us from every lawless deed. It's an awesome picture. God's compassion toward the needy, pointing toward his compassion, towards our greatest need, satisfied fully in Christ. God's compassion. Widows here in particular were very often very poor, very destitute, unable to provide for themselves. Women were barred from employment outside the home. And so when their husband died, they were often left very vulnerable, very poor. If they had a son, the son would take care of them. Uh, if there was a brother of their husband who died, the brother would take care of them in such a situation with Boaz. The great compassion of God toward these who are most needy in society, the Lord, in His compassion, gives specific instruction for how we're to interrelate with Him, how we're to take care of them, how we're to provide for them. The widow was to be cared for by her remaining family. When there was no family, the people, God's people, were to do it. Look at one account. I want to give you an example of this. Look at Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Here, an example of Christ showing compassion toward a widow. Specifically here, a widow. Again, keeping in mind, keeping in his heart the, the circumstances that the widow was in. These are the most needy. We have needy in our day and age, don't we? Maybe a fatherless, maybe a widow, maybe an orphan. We have many needy. Look at Luke chapter 7. Look in beginning in verse 11. Jesus, in his great compassion, sees that this widow's son, her only support in her life was now dead. And moved with compassion for the widow, Jesus Christ raises her son from the dead. In verse 11 it says, Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. 
the only son of his mother. In other words, that was her only source of help, her only source of support. And he now was dead. Verse 13, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. And he said to her, do not weep. And then he came and he touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And so he who is dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. You know, the Lord doing a miracle to attest to the fact that he was God in the flesh, but also to, in his compassion, to support this widow by raising her son from the dead, moved with compassion. Another example, in Acts chapter 6, we have the new church in Jerusalem, uh, and the Hellenist widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food, and so the church took care to assign deacons, raised up deacons so that they could provide for the widow compassion toward the needy, specifically here toward widows. It reflects the heart of God. Incidentally here, God's heart of compassion toward those in need is to be lived out and demonstrated and displayed by the Christian. When we talk about bringing glory to God or glorifying God, God is fully glorified in and of himself. You can't add to his glory and you can't take away from his glory. So when we speak of glorifying God, what we speak of is reflecting the attributes of God, reflecting him and who he is in what we say and do. And as such, we are reflecting his glory. So when we reflect the glory of God in his heart of compassion toward the needy, we ourselves in the name of Christ, are compassionate. We're to show compassion. So much so, and to the point where James says in chapter 1, verse 27, that pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. We are to be the hands and feet of God's compassion toward the needy, to demonstrate His heart. We're to point them to Christ in that. And bear in mind now, the compassion here should be shown to all those in need, the sick, the elderly, the disabled, a whole other category that has been brought about today that wasn't as popular back then is abandoned single mothers, where the husband abandons them with the kids. They're often in need. And in 1 Timothy chapter 5, we're to see the compassion of God, certainly towards all those in need, but specifically here toward widows. And it's a compassion that we are commanded to display as well. And we get that from verse 3, beginning with point 1 on your notes. There is the compassion to provide. If we're going to have godly compassion, you must have the compassion to provide for those in need. Verse 3 says, we're to honor widows who are really widows. That is a command. We're to honor widows who are really widows. Now, it's important to note here that the word for widow doesn't mean only a woman whose husband has died. It means a woman without a husband. It can do double duty. Not only a woman whose husband has died, but it's a category of woman who doesn't have a husband. And in this sense, it's important today because in our day and age, we've produced this category of women who've been abandoned by their husbands and left without anything. From verse 3 now, though, it is obvious that a distinction is being made. Honor widows who are really widows, or widows indeed, truly widows. And we get this distinction cleared up for us from verses 4 through 8. Who are widows who are really widows? If we look at verses 4 through 8, we can see two characteristics, two primary characteristics that are brought forth here in verse 4. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. So the first characteristic is she must be in need, having temporal needs that no one else can meet. There are no grandchildren. There are no children. There's no one else in the family that can take care of of her needs. She is truly in need. There's no one else that can meet that need. In other words... A rich widow isn't in need. If she's got a bunch of money, she doesn't need help. She can provide for herself. If she's got family that should provide for her, she doesn't need help. Uh, She can provide for herself through her family, all right? So she must be in need. Characteristic two, we see in verse five. Look at verse five. It says, now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. The second characteristic of those who are really widows is she must have a record of godly Christian life, 
godly Christian service, an exemplary Christian character. One, she needs to be really in need. There's no one else that can take care of her. Two, she has a godly example, a godly life. She's showing piety in her Christian life. It says of those, that person who is really a widow then, who meets those two characteristics, that we are to honor them. Timao is the word. It's a present active imperative. It means it's a command to us. And it's to be a part of the way that we generally do things. We're to care for those in need who are really widows. Now that word honor there, at a minimum, it includes respect or reverence, the way that we would think about it today. But that word honor in the Greek is also loaded down with a sense of financial support, financial aid. When the scripture says in Exodus 20, honor your father and your mother, that word there, honor, the Greek word that is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the same word. And it means not only reverence and respect, but also provide for them financially. It's honor. And we get the same word. If you drop down in chapter 5 to verse 17, we see this word again referring to elders. Look at verse 17. It says here, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. There it is. It's a noun form especially those who labor in word and doctrine. And here's where we get the understanding, where we see the sense of financial support in verse 18. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So that word for honor there implies the sense of financially supporting, okay? So this is the compassion to provide. You respect and you honor, you financially care for one those who have no one else that can meet that need. Two, they have a godly Christian example, all right? But point two on your notes, you must have, if you want to have godly compassion, you've got to have the compassion to pastor. Compassion to provide and now compassion to pastor, to shepherd this circumstance appropriately. Sometimes in these situations, it's not always about writing the check, right? You've got a concern for the widow, the one in need. You've got a concern for the family. You have a concern for the church, and those things need to be managed. They need to be shepherded. They need to be pastored correctly. Verse 4 says, But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now, in this thoughtful shepherding, point one here is that if there is family involved, the family, verse 4, is to first take care of the widow. It says, let them learn. That's another imperative command. In other words, Timothy is to let the family learn this lesson. They are to first take care of the widow, and there's going to be benefit for them in this. Let them learn, Paul says. And it says they must first learn, first learn here how to take care of things in their own home. Godliness, piety, living for God, being uh, of a pure heart, a pure mind, a pure conscience, living for the Lord begins at home. Godliness and piety begins within the doors of your own house. Uh, if you're going to live a godly life, it begins with how you treat your husband. It begins with how you treat your wife, how you raise your kids. It begins with how you manage the home. Piety starts at home. And here, this is going to cultivate godliness out at home. Verse 4, they are to learn to show piety at home. And then it says something interesting. It says here, to repay their parents. Godly piety begins at home, and this is practical godliness. This is what it means to serve God. But this also represents the care that we're to take in providing for a widow or providing here for father and mother as a means of repaying them for all that they've invested in you. So there's two things here that these parents, so these family members, are going to learn. One, they're going to learn how to provide for those in their own household by obeying, where does that command come from? comes from Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother. Listen, one of the things that Paul has to take into consideration here with Timothy is to say the family needs to obey that commandment. And in obeying that commandment, there's a blessing for obeying that commandment. They need to learn how to do that at home. Godly piety begins at home. Obey the Lord. Honor your father and your mother. And part of honoring your father and your mother is taking care of those in need in your own household, father and mother who may need financial support, that's how you're going to do that. And in a sense, think about it for a moment. All that your mother and father invested in you. Think about the time. If you were blessed to be raised in a godly Christian home, wow, I mean, 
what a tremendous blessing. If you were raised and just made it through, <laughs> what a tremendous blessing. I've been, you know, talk to people that are, you know, younger folks disgruntled about their parents. And I'm like, you know, let's put this in perspective for a moment. Have your parents ever taken a hot oven rack to you? No? Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, you have clothes on your back. Where'd you get those clothes from? Yeah, praise the Lord. You, you don't look like you've gone hungry lately. You've been eating good? Yeah, praise the Lord, right? Think about all that was invested in you uh, from your parents. Are you thankful? Are you grateful from your heart for your mom and dad, for your father and your mother? Or are you embittered against them? Are you holding on to resentment against your father or your mother? Are you holding on to anger, unforgiveness? That's sin. That is inconsistent with the Christian life. You need to repent of that and honor your father and your mother. Certainly it means respect, but it also means financial support. This is, in a sense, God's retirement plan. <laughs> you know, we're to save. It's prudent to save. It's wise to save, to make provisions for the future. But this also is the way that the Lord has commanded that we are to take care of those in need in society. We're to honor our father and our mother, take care of widows. It's something that has to be learned. And if we simply wrote a check, all of that gets missed, right? This takes discretion in how we apply the Word of God. It takes discretion with how we serve those in need, all right? And this is representing here. Uh, a way to repay, the Bible says, repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Incidentally, that's our motivation, right? What's your motivation for doing this, for, command, for obeying the commands of the Lord? Well, our motivation, one is because we want to please Him. Here, a great motivation is that this is good and acceptable before God. We want to honor God. We're going to obey Him in this. There's another factor here, all right, with handling things this way and allowing the family to care for those widows, their father or mother uh, who is under their care, and that's another issue, is that it will relieve the church. The church is to care for those who are really in need. If the church cares for everyone, resources are spread too thin, and they can't care for those who really need the care. So the church, in an effort to be wise stewards of the resources that God has given, are to be wise in who they care for. If you look at verse 16, look what it says. It says, If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are really widows. Now, this time in Ephesus, there were likely a lot of widows, a lot of folks in need, not just widows. There were so many widows that in many churches, there was actually a group, an identifiable group of widows in the church that were working and serving that the church was supporting but in order for the church to be careful about those who they care for, to have the resources to obey the Lord and caring for those in need, that's why the characteristics are here. One, that they have no one else who can provide for them. And two, they meet this godly standard. They have a godly example. We need to care for those who are really, truly widows. And again, this is a shepherding decision, a pastoral decision, a compassionate decision. It's not always the compassionate thing to do is just simply to write a check. Um, and there is, listen, a rebuke from Christ if we don't obey this. Uh, there are many rebukes in Scripture. Let me give you one example. Turn with me to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. If we're not faithful in this, there's a rebuke. In Mark chapter 7, there's a rebuke for those that hypocritically fail to take care of father and mother. Hypocritically uh, failed to take care of those in need. Mark chapter 7, and look down beginning at verse 9. Right? And just uh, godless hypocrites that wanted to neglect the command of God in these things. In verse 9, the Bible says, He said to them, Jesus did, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Verse 10. For Moses said, here it is in the Ten Commandments, right? Honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. That's a capital offense to curse your father or mother. It meant death. If you're a young man, a young woman, and you need to watch your tongue. Watch how you interact with your father and mother. Uh, this was a capital offense. By God's doing in the Old Testament, you could be put to death 
for disrespect toward your parents, okay? But there's a contrast, verse 11. You hear what Moses said, verse 10, but in verse 11, but you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down and many such things as you do. In other words, he, you take the words of Moses, honor your father or mother by your tradition. What you say is that everything you have, your possessions, your finances, are vowed or committed to the temple, committed to God. And so you know what, mom and dad, I, I'd really take care of you if I could. I mean, I've got all this extra money in my bank account, but listen, that's been dedicated to the temple. It's been dedicated to God. So I'd take care of you if I could, but that money's been assigned already. And oftentimes it was only given at their death. They had full access to it until they died. Sometimes it was given right away. But in other words, they neglect what Moses said and avoid the commandment given by Moses by saying, this has been a gift given to God. This has been dedicated to God and I can't help you. It's just wicked hypocrisy, right? And that's what they were doing. Um, This is making them, they thought, exempt from what Moses said. I don't want to obey God. I want this for myself, and so I'm going to make some wicked thing up to get around. You know, I'm going to find a loophole. It's wickedness. There is a rebuke here for those that do that. We need to be faithful to take care of those in need. Under this issue of compassion to pastor here, though, there's a widow in the church who is really a widow. One, it's defined by, or that widow who's really a widow, described by her family circumstances, uh, and again, by her character. Look at that in verse... Um, five. Now she who is really a widow and left alone, that therefore left alone means made solitary, left without family, left without anyone, right? So she's left alone, but look what she does. She trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. Look again at her character. Again, these two issues, right? Those who are really in need, they've got no one else to take care of them, and those who display godly character, godly example. Here, it's She trusts in God, she's relying on God, she's depending on God, and that is demonstrated or manifested, displayed in her prayer life, in her supplications and prayers, figure of speech, night and day. We have the same figure of speech today, right? It means all the time. She's praying to God all the time. Here, this godly character. So not only dictated by family circumstances, the true widow, the one who is to be supported, is the one with a godly example, a good example. She's selfless in this sense. She's devoted to God. She is with great need, but she completely trusts God for her provision. She's depending on God completely. And listen to this. If, if you hope in God, if you truly are trusting God, if you're truly from the heart depending on God, that is going to be expressed in prayer. If your prayer life is some dusty old unused thing that you've got shoved off in a corner that you only use when you really need something, you have no communion with God in that sense. You're not trusting Him by faith. You're not living for Him in faith. You're not depending on Him. If you trust and depend and rely and hope in Christ, it's going to express itself in your prayer life. You're going to be in prayer and evidenced in her by her continuous prayer night and day. It's just an expression of our faith. It's interesting here that this godly character. The life of this widow is contrasted in a couple of places. One, it's contrasted in verse 6. It's contrasted with the one who lives in pleasure, who is dead while she lives, right? But it's also contrasted in verse 11. Look at verse 11. Refuse the younger widows. Listen, don't help them. Refuse the younger widows. Don't enroll them in the number. For when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. So again, this necessity of those are, we're going to help to maintain a godly character, a godly example. Uh, Those in verse 6, those in verse 11 are self-indulgent, living for themselves. You know, a good example of this is Anna. And many of you remember Anna from Luke chapter 2. Turn there with me, Luke chapter 2. Again, just to see an example of a widow who is truly a widow, a widow in need and a widow indeed. (laughs) Luke chapter 2, 
and look at verse 36. 36. Here, Anna. Listen to this. Now, there was one, Anna, it says in verse 36, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. And she was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Look at how this elderly, godly widow served the Lord, right? This is a great example, Anna, of one who is truly a widow. You see, you're a widow by her family circumstances. She had no one else. Anna was alone. But then you see her by her godly character. And this is defined again by Contrast, look at verse 6 back in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Contrast Anna with what we see in verse 6. In verse 6 it says, uh, But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. Anna is contrasted with the self-indulgent, pleasure-seeking widow in verse 6. She's dead while she lives. This issue, dead while she lives, depicts the utter worthlessness, the utter uselessness of, of a life lived for self. If you are living life for yourself, living life for the fleeting pleasures of this world, you are living a useless, worthless life. Does that mean you can't have any fun? <laughs> no. I mean you can't take a vacation every now and then or go to a movie or watch a TV show? No. But if your life is characterized by the pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of leisure, the pursuit of your own self-indulgence, it is a worthless and useless life. You are physically alive, but you're dead, as if dead in sins. You're dead. It's interesting in the Septuagint, the, again, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this same word here, this um, living for pleasure, is used to describe Sodom. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, the Bible says, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. Speaking of that wicked city, you're familiar with that, right? Wicked city of Sodom. Uh, she and her daughters, Sodom, had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease. That's the same word there, prosperous ease for living for pleasure. Um, but, it says of Sodom, they did not aid the poor and needy. Sodom was, Sodom was destroyed by God destroyed by God for their wickedness here seen in their excess of pride, excess of food, their prosperous ease, and the fact that they did not aid, did not help the poor and needy. This requires this distinguishing between the two and who that we help in distinguishing that requires a pastoral decision, pastoral compassion. Uh, it requires you to be pastoral maybe in the decision that you make to help someone. Is this a person who is truly in need? And don't take on false guilt about that. That's a, that's a decision that needs to be made, and it's instructed that we make that from Scripture here. Is this a person who has a godly example, living a godly life, living for the Lord? Are they truly in need, or is there someone else who can meet this need? If there's someone else that can meet that need, it's the responsibility of those in the church to exhort them to meet that need through those that can provide for them um, so that the church is relieved, right? There are distinguishing characteristics that in the wisdom of God, we're to take into consideration when we do these things. Now, Paul goes on to say in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 7, he says to Timothy, these things, Timothy, you've got to command. These things command that they may be blameless. It's interesting there that the they are the families. You're to command these things so that those who are responsible to obey the command of the Lord to honor father and mother, that they could be blameless. Certainly that the widows would be blameless. Certainly that the church would be above reproach, but that the families would be blameless also. He goes on in verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So after clarifying and contrasting, after the instruction for who is a widow, a widow in truth, uh, really a widow, um, he brings up failing in this area, failing to support. And in verse 8, if anyone does not provide... That word there for provide means um, foresight. It means planning. We're to think through ahead of time 
how we're going to provide for those who are in our sphere of influence that we're to meet their need, how we're going to do that. We need to make plans to do it for his own. It goes beyond just widows here. It says, especially of those for his own household. Men, especially applies to you in this. This goes beyond just meeting the needs of widows. goes beyond just honoring father and mother and speaks to you providing for your own household. If you don't provide for those of your own household, you're not adequately and faithfully making provision for your house. It is as if you have disowned the faith. It's as if you are a living denial of the gospel in your life, a living denial of the faith. Even an unbeliever, a lost person, knows that the family needs to be provided for. Even a lost person knows that. And so those that know that and fail to uphold that and fail to provide are worse than an unbeliever, and they live as though they're denying the faith. So in that sense, verse 8, if you don't provide for your own, and especially for those of your own household... You've denied the faith. You walk in a way that is denying the Christian gospel, and you're worse than an unbeliever who knows better. And in that, you bring reproach on yourself, and you bring reproach on the church. So demonstrating compassion in this is necessary. Godly compassion in providing. It's interesting, you know, to use an example, our great example, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, with the the burden of the world's sins on His shoulders, spoke to three people on the cross, right? God the Father, he spoke to the thief that was hanging next to him, and who else did he speak to? He spoke to John. Why? Make arrangements for his mother, right? He's about to die, and Jesus Christ is caring for his mother, who is a widow now, without a son to care for her. So what does he do? He makes arrangements for John to care for her. That's the compassion of God toward those who are most needy. And in caring for those who are most needy, it points us to the great care and compassion that God showed in providing the needy sinner, Christ. It's God's compassion. To sum up, if it's determined that there's no family and that a widow is truly alone, and if the widow meets the character standards laid out, then the widow becomes the responsibility of the church. And we're to care for them. Examine yourself. How are you providing? Are you honoring father and mother? Do you have those around you who are in need? The Christian, if you're here today claiming the name of Christ, when you see a need, you see a needy brother, a needy sister, someone comes with a need, do you jump in and help? Or is it be warm and be filled? All right? It's not to be be warm and be filled. We're to put feet, we're to put action to our compassion. We're to display the need-meeting compassion of God toward those in need. We need to be faithful in that. We need to be faithful in that, as, as a church in that. You need to be faithful in your family with that. Or we can't see our brother or our sister in need when we have goods that can meet that need and we hold up those goods to ourselves. We have the capacity to help and we don't. Are you guilty of that? When you're made aware of the need, the email comes through, the call comes through, you think to yourself, yeah, somebody else will get that. We're to meet those needs. What, whose are those things that you have? God, then what would He have you do with them? Meet the need. We're to obey the Lord in that. Otherwise, if, if you bring reproach on yourself, you bring reproach on the church. And we've got to be faithful to the Lord in those things. And I tell you, if we're faithful to the Lord in those things, there's a great blessing. I'm amazed. I'm, I'm so grateful to God for the many, many ways that He has blessed this church. Uh, it is a beautiful thing. And would you say amen? Amen. Grateful to God for all that He's done here. That the, the joy, the love, the fellowship, the, the evangelism, the people being saved, all of that doesn't happen by accident. That comes about as a fruit of the faithfulness of God's people to obey the Lord, to love Him, to hate sin, to love His Word, to obey Him. And we've got to obey Him in this area. Uh, If there's a need, step up and meet that need. If you have this world's goods, meet the need. Uh, There'll be a time when you're in need, right? We find ourselves in need. 
uh, and the brothers will be faithful to meet your need too. Let's serve the Lord in this. Let's be faithful to the Lord in this, and let's watch God work. Uh, God is faithful to his promises, all right? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for this very practical, very clear um, instruction from Scripture. And God, thank you for this. And I, I pray even now by your spirit that you would apply this truth to our hearts, that we might live fervently for you. God, that we, by the strength of your spirit, might show godly compassion to those in need. And in doing that, point them to Christ, point them to their greatest need, point them to your greatest provision, point them to the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. They might be saved. We want to be a good testimony of you, Lord, displaying your attributes, God displaying your great love and compassion toward us in how we show love and compassion toward others. And so help us in this, God. Convict us where we're in sin. Uh, keep this in our minds, Lord. Don't let it uh, seep in one ear and out the other. But help us to live for you in this fervently and uh, to be faithful in these things for your glory. We love you, Lord. Thank you for this time and your word. Thank you for your word. And thank you for Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.